Welcome back, Left Reckoners. I'm Matt Leck. With me, David Griscom. Hello, David. Hey, brother. How are you doing? I'm doing very well, and I'm pleased uh, that we are joined once again by our good friend and teacher, Milton Alamadi. Uh, Milton, welcome back to Left Reckoning. My pleasure. Thank you for having me once again. How are uh, you guys? We're doing really well. Uh, we're not on spring break, uh, as, as uh, <laughs> Professor Milton is, um, but, uh, uh, you know, uh, it's starting to feel like spring, at least in New York. Yes. I'm enjoying that. Especially yesterday. Um, it was a beautiful day. was very nice. Um, we have we have Milton uh, joining us once again on the occasion of the release of this book here, uh, Adwa, Empress Tetu, and Emperor Menelik in Love and War. Uh, Milton, I'm... Uh, I'm super thrilled to talk about this. Thank uh, you. First of all, let's talk about the form. Uh, so there's some illustrations in here. Yes. Uh, uh, there's a, you know, plenty of text, uh, dramatized sort of uh, uh, history. Uh, just talk about the form and, you know, who you're trying to reach with this. Okay, very good. First of all, um, when you talk about history and war, it speaks to her a lot about nation states, the formation, creation of nation states, right? So when you talk about uh, the Battle of Waterloo, you know, people know what the Battle of Waterloo is. Mm -hmm. People know about the Normandy uh, landing, right? People know about Gettysburg. But when we talk about the African continent, you know, what do we know? We know of so-called tribal wars and wars of conquest. And yet we have a story, an unknown story, such as the Battle of Adwa, when the Ethiopians stopped Italian imperialism right on its track and defeated the army, captured thousands of soldiers, killed thousands, and forced Italy to pay reparations before releasing the captives after putting them to work for many, many months under the command and supervision of Africans. So, so you, know, you have things turned upside down, right? <laughs> so this is a story that I think has a potential global audience and needs to be told. And I wanted it to be told in an interesting and kind of a dramatic way because it lends itself mm -hmm. you know, to drama. There are not a lot of dramatized or, 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 or films about uh, spectacular African victories. So I wanted the reader not to read this just as a detached historical occurrence. I wanted to sort of bring it to, to life. And this, and this era in which we live, where people um, have a very visualized you know, appetite for consuming information, I thought this was a perfect fit to tell the story and then take those real historical incidents, but then imagine and create the conversations that could have, or perhaps actually did transpire. And then of course, in terms of some of the, like the declaration of war that the emperor makes, that is you know, verbatim mm -hmm. from the text of the declaration of war. But then of course, when the Empress Taitu is speaking with the Italian ambassador who is there to deceive them into signing this treaty then that led to the war in the first place. Obviously they had a conversation. So just imagine what <laughs> might they have uh, said. Uh, mm -hmm. So that is the technique I use to dramatize. Uh, that's why I call it dramatized history. I keep right. the factual historical incidents. I retain all of that and then create conversation whenever there's an opportunity to do so. And then of course, if you're going to dramatize it, it goes along with illustration. And I got this young Ugandan artist named Obedi Roth, who I think produced some spectacular piece mm -hmm. of art. And I met him, you know, just like you meet a lot of people nowadays on social media. <laughs> I saw some of his samples um, uh, um, on Twitter and I mm -hmm. got in touch with him and it turns out he's an architecture student at the National University in Uganda, Makerere University. And I said, listen, read this manuscript and give me your thoughts. And he was thrilled and he sent me back several uh, sample sketches for almost all the chapters. I said, okay, 
this is the person that is excellent and ideal to uh, to collaborate with. So that's how the structure came a bit about. Yeah, I, I love that. I mean, I'm a big historical fiction fan. Uh, Hilary Mantel's Wolf Hall novels, uh, I find good. Uh, you know, people who read Marxist theoreticians, Georg Lukács uh, wrote a uh, uh, book called The Historical Novel that goes into um, Waverly and the Sir Walter Raleigh novels. Oh, I need and, to read uh, that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's very good. And and so I love this, um, uh, that as like a sort of a project. And I think it really does... It helps me like, you know, I, I think like you can read a lot of history that's very dry. Right. And it's very theoretical and it's document based. Correct. And it's but to actually see it sort of, you know, like you say, um, dramatized, it, it really sticks the things into memory uh, uh, mm. in, a, in a way that I find really useful. So right. I, I, I and I will just say, you know, you kind of hinted at it, but if there's any producers of, uh, of film or television, this would be a great, I, I would watch this miniseries on, I think uh, so. on Amazon Prime. No, I really, um, I think so. Thanks for the plug. Yeah. Um, so let's get down to the content a little bit sure. here. Mm -hmm. um, the Berlin Conference of 1884. Correct. Uh, what was the Berlin Conference of 1884? Okay, very good. So after... Uh, most of Europe industrialized, beginning with England primarily, but most of Europe, at least Western Europe, uh, from 1760 to 1840. And this is the time, of course, where there was tremendous demand for raw materials uh, for the factories. And Africa had and has always had and still has abundant supplies. Uh, so the contest that you see, contemporary Europe for Africa, uh, from the West versus China, that was, you know, of course, China was not involved at that time, or the European uh, powers competing for the resources in Africa, the cheap labor, the land uh, to produce food, and then, of course, the mineral resources. In the early era, uh, you know, ivory was a big thing, and then later on, rubber, of course, they then, of course, discovered the minerals like diamond and uh, gold later on, and copper at another stage, uh, coltan, and now we have cobalt. But in the uh, late 19th century, uh, they wanted to mark out territories of exclusive uh, sourcing uh, in Africa. And there were almost incidents of European countries fighting against each other, clashes that could have led to major conflict. So they came up with this idea that, you know, if you're going to, uh, you know, steal this continent and carve it out, let's do it like a proper gentleman. So let's have a meeting and, you know, talk it over rather than fighting over. If there's any fighting that's to be done, let it be against the Africans. So that's why they met in Germany uh, from November 1884 to February 1885. Uh, the host was uh, Otto van Bismarck, the chancellor. And they, you know, as um, the Belgian king, uh, Leopold the uh, second, who actually did not attend, but had his representatives there, said, I am determined to have my piece of this magnificent African cake. So they sliced up the continent <laughs> like a cake. Uh, England got its zones, France, uh, Belgium, Italy, uh, Spain, uh, Germany, uh, Portugal, uh, may have left out somebody, probably not. Uh, and then of course, Holland and, uh, and England uh, competed uh, for South Africa. And later on, they came to an agreement that let's stop fighting and killing each other in South Africa. Let's subjugate the South Africans instead. So that's how they partitioned the continent. And that was the era called the scramble for Africa. And then Italy, which of course was a late arrival on the scene, as Italy itself did not uh, was not a unified Italy until toward the end of the century. Uh, Italy uh, started sending its army to mark out its zones. So initially, uh, it had success when it subdued uh, the region now called Eritrea, the country of Eritrea, and the reporting was amazing, and it was celebrating imperialism is celebrating white supremacy because it goes hand in hand because you have to justify mm -hmm. and you have to use that notion of the alleged need to civilize the natives right so i just want to 
you know, if you give me like a minute or two, maybe I can read a little bit of how the New York Times covered the initial conquest of Eritrea before the Please. battle, way, way before the Battle of Adwa. And this, of course, is from actually my other book, mm -hmm. <laughs> Manufacturing uh, Hate, Africa Was Demonized in Western Media. So here's the New York Times, uh, February 2nd, 1890. Uh, the headline, after Italy had uh, conquered uh, the region of Eritrea, that the Italians in Africa, results of Crispy's brilliant policy. Crispy was the prime minister at that time. So I, let me just read verbatim from the book, I guess. The Times proclaimed in the headline of a February 2nd, 1890 article, lauding the invasion, quote, declaration of a protectorate over King Menelik's domain, Europe's astonishment, end quote. The headline concluded using a different spelling of the emperor's name. The article was a melodramatic celebration of European imperial assault on Africa. Italy, according to the Times article, quote, had achieved triumph upon triumph in Africa, end quote. And there had been a surrender of, quote, all the tribes, end quote. The Italians had defeated Ras Alula, a renowned general who was referred to by European writers as, quote, the Garibaldi of Abyssinia, a reference to Giuseppe Garibaldi the famed general and politician who fought in the many wars leading to the unification of Italy in 1871. The Times for February 2nd, 1890 article claimed, quote, the natives welcomed the Italians as liberators, end quote. <laughs> quote, Europe now marvels and perhaps scarcely credits its own eyes. Italy in Adoa, <laughs> exclamation mark, end quote. The Times continued, quote, is it true or is it a dream? Nothing in the world has the power to drive the Italian troops from their central position, end quote. Now, in this same article, the real rationale for the, the imperial invasion comes out in the same article toward the end. Uh, okay, here we go. Quote, we could not thus speak, however, if the program of Italy in Africa was one of pure conquest because exploits exclusively military are in too great opposition to the sentiments of progress, of peace, of work, of companionship that should form the pivot of modern life, end quote, the article claimed. Quote, but instead, we may rejoice in and applaud this conquest of civilization and Christianity over barbarians and savages, over, over unbelief, over habits of ferocity, over brutal ignorance of every human law, <laughs> religious, social, and civil, end quote. And then I write here, these assertions about Ethiopia in the times were, of course, hollow. Christianity had become the country's official religion in parts of Ethiopia as early as 330 AD. Toward the end of the Times article celebrating conquest, the true motives behind Italy's aggression finally emerged in words that succinctly summed up the reasons behind Europe's anti-imperial assault on the, on the continent. Quote, the water roads of Africa and the large commercial arteries in the hands of Italy signify that they are also in the hands of the civilized world, which can now introduce without fear the benefits of commerce, of exchange, of relations of any and every sort and in short time produce the best profits from the immense natural wealth existing there, end quote. <laughs> I don't think there's a better article that just sums up. <laughs> well, I mean, I want to I want to get to, uh, you know, uh, uh, Empress Tate to an Emperor Menelik. Sure. Uh, uh, but I also just let's skip to like their introduction into this new world of civilization is being lied to about different translations of a treaty. Yes, yes, yeah. yes. Okay, so Italy uh, sends an envoy, uh, Pietro Antonelli, to negotiate or to sign this uh, Treaty of Wuchale in, uh, in uh, 1889. Uh, and it's, you know, a treaty to uh, improve relations between the two countries, to improve trade and commerce. But then there's Article 17 in the treaty. In the Amharic version, it says that Ethiopia has the option 
of using Italy as its intermediary in its dealings with other European powers. But the Italian version says something completely different. The Italian version says Ethiopia is obliged to use Italy in any of its dealing with the other European powers. So I'm paraphrasing it now. So in essence, they signed off their sovereignty to become an Italian protectorate. And then of course, at some stage, uh, they find out about this deception. And what do you do now? Mm -hmm. And this goes back to the uh, wisdom of both the couple, Empress Taitu and uh, Emperor Menelik. They bid their time because they realize that so long as Italy just calls us its protectorate, but does not send troops to occupy all parts of the country, we can live with that. And let's use this time period to build up our own army. At that time, many of the Ethiopian princes were still fighting amongst themselves to see who becomes the dominant king, who's referred to as the king of kings, the negus negaste, that's the word they use. But now Medelik and Tetu start talking to all the other rival princes and say the only way we can really defend ourselves against the Italians is if we unite and fight as one. So the Battle of Adwa is also seen as the beginning of Ethiopia as a modern uni 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 unified state. And the quest for modernization also accelerates at that time because Menelik himself actually was a big champion of modernization. To modernize the, the country, he had uh, Alfred Ilk, who was actually a real life character, you know, the Swiss character who was advising him, a European, mm. was his foreign policy advisor. You know, what, uh, what, 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 what to accept uh, from Europe and what not, not to accept. So in terms of uh, uh, electrification of parts of the city, um, uh, modern roads, modern sanitation systems, uh, Alfred Ilk was uh, uh, made significant contribution in terms of advising the royal couple um, about that. So they prepared, they mobilized, they imported, uh, they made some of their own weapons and they imported a lot of weapons from European countries that were also willing uh, to sell them weapons. And then at some point uh, they were ready to go to war and they went to war. Could, could you, sorry, before we get into um, more of the story, like, could you give um, the listeners a sense of like how the royal couple ruled, like how the power sort of divided there, what that relationship was like? Very good. Um, the empress was known to be very tough. Uh, the emperor was more laid back, more accommodating. The empress, her nickname uh, was... Uh, uh, Empress, no, essentially. Her first <laughs> instinct was to say no to any and every proposal. And then eventually, uh, you know, she might change her mind and say, okay, uh, maybe this is something we can go with. But uh, the emperor was too accommodating. So I think they made actually a very, they made a perfect match. They were good for each other because you couldn't, you couldn't say no uh, to everything. Mm -hmm. So occasionally after some back and forth, uh, they would uh, go. They would go with some proposals. Uh, they did deal with Italy initially, and actually managed to get a lot of arms uh, from from Italy, because Italy uh, wanted them to uh, to stay neutral when Italy was still occupying and trying to consolidate in parts of uh, Eritrea. And for that, in return, they actually got some of the same weapons that they later on used. Uh, against Italy when they decided to uh, defend their sovereignty at the Battle of Adwa. Um, before we get to how these uh, the sort of a military uh, uh, situation played out, I just want to dwell on like the and you know the, this touches on your 
previous book, Manufacture and Hate as well, the way documentation is used, because you look at like at this the same sort of time period, like, you know, post-Civil War time period in America, it was also a time of signing trees with Native Americans that Correct. were like very spurious, yes. but like made to basically like clear, like in the eyes of some sort of future but really, like we look back on it, and it's like, and the news, newspapers themselves saying, like, "Oh, they greeted us liberators." Like, well, I saw, you know, CNN talk about that with Iraq. Exactly uh, right. And, uh, you know, it's, <laughs> you it's you just see, like you see the consistency, pattern. right? <laughs> right, exactly. Yeah. So that was actually widespread um, throughout the African continent. You know, uh, Congo, for example, under King Leopold. And as you know, uh, his agent was actually Henry Morton Stanley, the so-called correspondent for the uh, uh, Herald uh, Tribune. Uh, many people mistake him for being an American. He actually wasn't. He was, uh, uh, I think, a Scottish Wales uh, mix. But uh, many of his activities were on behalf of the American publication that uh, many people conclude that uh, he was American. So he was Leopold's agent in the Congo, and he made all these African rulers sign these so-called treaties. I don't even know what language those treaties were in, <laughs> perhaps in, uh, uh, in French, um, and then came back to make his claim at the Berlin Conference. It was on the basis of those treaties that he produced, that he said his agent had concluded with all these uh, local rulers in the Congo region. And that's how he laid claim on the Congo. And as you know, uh, from that uh, you know famous book, uh, The Ghost of Leopold, mm -hmm. the uh, genocidal kind of uh, regime that he imposed on the Congo and legitimized his rule by holding up those so-called uh, treaties. And of course, there are many parts of Africa where the same process uh, was duplicated. Yeah, I mean, just like, and, and then meanwhile, talking all high and mighty about welcome to civilization, I just think is, it's just a very, yes, it's civilization. Just an amazing contrast. <laughs> civilization with, uh, and what was Leopold's civilization in the Congo? If you didn't produce enough rubber, your mm. head was cut off or your foot was, you know, hacked off. And then they would make uh, other uh, uh, Congolese hold up these limbs and they took these famous or infamous black and white photographs that you can find in a lot of history books. And I don't know if you remember seeing that uh, film, uh, Lumumba by Raoul Peck. You know, the beginning, the opening starts by showing those uh, photographs. And those mm -hmm. photographs were then shown to other uh, communities in the Congo to uh, inspire them or motivate them to produce more rubber <laughs> or to produce uh, more tusks. Otherwise, they would end up with the same fate as well. Yeah. That was yeah. a civilization that Leopold brought uh, to, to uh, the Congo. And I just want to add one more part. In the same film, uh, Leo, uh, Raoul Peck also has a very good scene, which of course happened in real true life, when King um, Baduan, who is a descendant, I think a great, great, uh, 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 great, great uh, nephew of uh, Leopold. He was the king at the time that Congo won its independence in 1960. And when he got there, he read this speech that really infuriated uh, Patrice Lumumba. He's saying, you know, we didn't come here the conquering power, mm -hmm. you know, uh, uh, Leopold came here as an agent of civilization. And we hope, basically we're saying, you don't mess up <laughs> what, we gift, we, what we are gifting to you. And of course, when Patrice Lumumba got up, he spoke, said, no, we have to uh, be truthful. You know, there was blood, uh, there was humiliation, there was racism, there was exploitation. Um, and of course, uh, they never forgave him for that speech. And I think that actually was when they put the bull's mark on him. I think eventually they would have eliminated him anyway. Uh, mm -hmm. The Belgians were determined not to let go of uh, the copper mines that they had. And of course, the US uh, not to let go of the uranium. The uranium 
that uh, they used in producing the first atomic bomb that uh, was dropped on Japan came actually from Congo when it was still under Belgian rule, mm. under it was called Belgian uh, Congo uh, at the time. So he was a mock man from the very beginning. I think that speech just uh, they made the decision to get rid of him earlier than they might have. Mm -hmm. Uh, let's let's talk about the actual military uh, engagements here um, with the sort of uh, against the Italians. So am I getting it right that there was a siege? Uh, is that the first uh, engagement or is that the second? That is the, no, the final engagement, the second engagement, yes, you're right, the second engagement before the Battle of Adwa and right, the right. siege of this fort at Mekele was actually inspired the, the Empress herself. Um, and that was actually in the in the, in the real history. That's how it actually uh, happened. Uh, they were sustaining a lot of losses, and she was uh, wondering why was there a need to attack uh, the, uh, the 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 fort and destroy the defenders of the fort when they needed uh, to survive on water. <laughs> they didn't have any uh, water source within the fort, the, the the fort itself. So basically, you know, let's wait them out. And that's exactly how it transpired. They waited them out. They uh, eventually had to surrender. And uh, once again, here's where the balance worked out well. The empress wanted to uh, basically exterminate them. Uh, and the emperor said, actually, by keeping them alive and escorting them, it will allow us to relocate our own army into a better vantage point. For the main battle itself, uh, so yeah, she uh, she's credited for the uh, defeat of uh, the Italian garrison at the fort at Mekele. And let's talk. Uh, you know, we don't need to describe it. People should need to buy the book uh, for the <laughs> you know the vivid description. But the battle itself, yeah, the battle itself. But first of all, mm. I think it was so shocking for the Italians because they believed in that kind of notion uh, that you heard me read from the New York Times. Mm -hmm. And the commander in chief, General Oreste Baratieri, had promised when he was still in Rome that he would return with the uh, Emperor Menelik in a cage so that he could be displayed in the, uh, in, the, in the zoos in Rome. And I really believe they actually believed in that notion. So they were overconfident. Um, and actually, since Baratieri was a bit wise and had been involved in many battles, he was not that eager to plunge head on into war. He, if he had complete control, he might have waited it out and let the cost of sustaining a huge Ethiopian army also start maybe wearing it down a little and weaken mm -hmm. the Ethiopians. But his other commanders, you know, were pressuring him you know, how, 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 how can, a, a, essentially saying, how can a European army, you know, wait out and use those kind of tactics, you know, you know, well, let's just go in and destroy them. And he was actually getting a lot of pressure from the prime minister as well. You know, Crispy was sending him cable upon cable upon cable from Rome, accusing him of being a coward. What are you mm -hmm. waiting for? At the, at the end, he uh, succumbed. Uh, to the political pressure, and he decided to uh, go uh, head on. And of course, um, as the uh, chapter describes, the uh, Ethiopians uh, basically surrounded the army from different uh, locations. Uh, and at the end, they were destroying the army so thoroughly that they allowed them a passageway to get away and flee to Eritrea which is the region that they uh, was, had already been colonized by, by Italy. And Baratieri himself, who had promised to come back with Menelik in a cage, actually fled from the battlefield, where obviously nobody likes dying, and he didn't want to die. Uh, so he also fled. Uh, two of his uh, uh, brigadier generals were killed. One was captured together with almost uh, 3,000 other uh, Italian uh, uh, soldiers, uh, and about 3,000 also were killed on the battlefield at uh, at Adwa. 
it, it seems like a more a larger scale version of uh, like a lot of the similar elements of Custer's uh, uh, defeat. Yes. Uh, like especially that you talk about the hubris. Uh, there were uh, folks on the in the Seventh Cavalry saying, you know, we could. I think Custer himself saying, well, yeah, we could whip all the Indians in the plains with just one unit of cavalry. And it's like, well, that was the <laughs> attitude. That was the exact yeah. attitude that they have. You know, you know, and. The prime minister, in particular, you know, forcing them to the note to the extent that he's calling his own general a coward on a daily basis, you know, <laughs> and you know how you know how people in the military, you know, and they love that. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so they fell straight into the um, the Ethiopian uh, Ethiopian trap, and and Menelik's commanders actually wanted them to pursue Italy all the way into Eritrea and exterminate the entire army. And Menelik held back, and his argument was that we have such a large army. In fact, it was taking its toll because feeding the army mm. uh, was, uh, was taking its toll. He said, if we go there and defeat them, then we are going to have to occupy uh, uh, Eritrea, and then how would we sustain such an army? So he overruled his commanders, and that's how Better Thierry actually managed to get away alive. Otherwise, he would have been exterminated as well. I mean, that is a, a, a really fascinating story. Um, is there anything you, as far as like, you know, subsequent relevance, like in the, I mean, whether today or over the next like 100 years um, that you think like, like people should look to uh, following reading this book? Okay, well, first of all, I think obviously it uh, exploded that myth of, uh, you know, white mm -hmm. supremacy, mm -hmm. that an African army could not stand up against and defeat a, um, a, a European army. And it inspired really uh, even African descendants around the world, even in, in as far as in Haiti, uh, were, were inspired by the Italian victory at um, at Adwa, and then of course it even had impact in Italy itself. So you have a defeat of an Italian army in an African uh, country having mm -hmm. direct repercussions on the streets of Italy. There were riots on the streets, and uh, there were attacks on the private residence of Prime Minister Crispy. Uh, the Pope had a major banquet that was planned, an annual banquet that the Pope canceled because of the defeat. And then ultimately the government of uh, Crispy itself collapsed. And he had to, uh, they had to uh, have a, a new prime minister as a result. So this is quite historic. And a mm -hmm. defeat in an African country bringing down a government uh, in Europe. And the, one of the contemporary lessons actually that I tell uh, to my Ethiopian friends, because if you've been following the history, of course, uh, right now there's been a, uh, a disastrous civil war in, uh, in Ethiopia, uh, uh, primarily between the central government in Addis Ababa and the region in Tigray, where the Battle of Adwa was actually fought. <laughs> so it's so ironic that you know, on that occasion, they all came together, they fought as one, all the different regions, and that, as I said earlier, can be uh, seen as a starting point of the modern Ethiopian state. Uh, mm -hmm. And yet, you almost had this war tear all those gains apart. Uh, there is an ongoing peace process right now, and when I talk to my Ethiopian friends, I say, you know, you guys need to go back and learn that lesson of the Battle of Adwa. You managed to defeat an imperial power by coming together as one. Um, and now it's very sad to see that you could absolutely uh, self implode. Take that lesson of the uh, critical need for national uh, unity uh, from the Battle of Adwa. 
Yeah. I mean, I think that's such a, a very interesting point you make about the history of these things. You know, talk, look at the Shakespeare, the way he writes about those battles being central to your British uh, sort of idea of themselves. Yes. Yeah. Um, yes. And, and Ethiopia is unique in that mm -hmm. respect, really, in mm -hmm. uh, among all the African countries, you know. Uh, yeah. They've never seen themselves really as uh, second to none. And uh, uh, this obviously played out again in 1936 when uh, under fascist uh, uh, Mussolini, mm -hmm. once yeah. again, invaded uh, Ethiopia. And what was he doing? Primarily, he wanted to uh, avenge <laughs> the defeat <laughs> at 1896. You know, March 1896, he wanted to come back and avenge that defeat. It could never sit well with him. And Ethiopia, of course, was betrayed by the so-called fellow members of the League of Nations. You know, mm -hmm. Ethiopia was a part of the League of Nations. It was the only independent African uh, state at that time that it was yeah. invaded. There's a very famous uh, uh, scene where uh emperor selassie comes to the headquarters of the league of nations and he's saying you know we have to stand up to the ideals of this of this the, the founding documents of this organization you know why is the league of nations standing aside and watching uh italy's aggression uh, italy had already uh, declared its intent to invade and nothing was done and it was a bloody war. They used, I think, the first time the use of, um, you know, chemical weapons mm -hmm. on an African country, mustard gas, you know. Uh, mm -hmm. So eventually they conquered. But once again, uh, the Ethiopians continued their guerrilla war and uh, fighting with soldiers from other African countries also who were fighting, of course, on the allied uh, sides. So eventually, uh, they managed to drive out the Italians once again under Mussolini from their country. I was curious how much the the historical memory played into the Mussolini thing because that that's like if George W. Bush is like, "Oh, we're going back into Vietnam." <laughs> Absolutely, <laughs> of course. <Yeah>. I mean, <laughs> that was the rallying the rallying message. Actually, you know, this is like a, a Adua Part Two. Mm -hmm. So, right. yeah, that was a very powerful weapon in motivating. And it also inspired other Africans to want to go to the defense of Ethiopia and African descendants all over the world. In mm -hmm. Harlem, there's a very interesting documentary called A, a Long and Mighty Walk about John Henry Clark, the late Professor John Henry Clark. And he talks about how there were, and actually there were actually footage, film footage of lines of uh, African-Americans lining up to sign up to go and fight in defense of uh, using uh, Ethiopia's uh, old uh, name, uh, Abyssinia. They wanted to go and fight against Mussolini on behalf of Abyssinia. So here's the interesting thing. Uh, the US would not allow them uh, people that had volunteered, African-Americans who had volunteered to go and fight to help defend Ethiopia, to go. would not allow them to leave the country to go there. Uh, but uh, European-Americans who wanted to go and fight <laughs> on uh, behalf of Italy against uh, Ethiopia were allowed to go. You know? Wow. Yeah, wow. That's, a, that's another untold story. You know? I was going to say, like, I know at the same time, uh, Americans were allowed to go to Spain to fight, you know, on the bet on the Lincoln brigades to fight on the yes. good side there. But like, yeah, yes. uh, we should not have allowed them to go fight on behalf of Italy. <laughs> that is yes. wild yes. policy. Yes. Oh, my goodness. Uh, well, uh, Milton, uh, where can people buy Adawa? OK, very good. So right now, the E version is available on Amazon. And the paperback version will also be available on Amazon within a few days. And right now, I still have what I call, and I'm glad you're, you're holding it up, the collector's edition of the hardcover. And that is available only on a website dedicated to uh, the hardcover. And it's called tatuandmenelik.com. So it combines their first names. 
uh, and his last name, of course. So it's T A Y T U and A N D, of course, and then Melodic, M E N E L I K dot com. And that's how people can get the hard copy for the time being. Okay. And of course, I'm happy to do any readings or signings anywhere. <laughs> I actually yeah. did a very nice one in the state uh, office building, the Adam Clayton State Office building in Harlem. The um, uh, state senator, uh, Cordell Clear, had, uh, it was in celebration of Women's History Month. Because what I did is also I played up the role of Empress Taitu. Because mm -hmm. Empress Taitu had 6,000 men under her command on the front line. So I think her role in this, uh, first of all, in holding up the Ethiopian state, mm -hmm. and then being a part of the battle on the front line, and urging her husband, who was more accommodationist and always leaned toward the need to negotiate, saying, oh, no, no, this has to resolve in, in battle. So I thought she'd never gotten her just dues. That's why I played her up in the book, and I played up her role uh, on the cover as well. So she held a uh, hosted a book signing uh, to celebrate uh, Tatu's role uh, during uh, Women's History Month. And it was very good. It was a Monday. I was kind of concerned it's a Monday, but we had about 50 people showed up. And I took 40 copies and I came back with none. So I was happy. <laughs> oh, great. awesome. Right. Great. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah, any uh, film producers, you know, I would like to watch this. Uh, yes, me too. Yeah, I want to put this on my queue. So um, uh, at Alamadi, uh, we'll also link to your uh, Twitter uh, in the show notes. Thanks so much, man. Thank you. Thank you, buddy. Always happy to be with you guys. Stay strong.